one. All righty. So we are very honored to be joined by Lord Chris Fox from Windsor in the United Kingdom, who's going to be sharing with us some perspective on how the world is going to look in the post-corona or em emerging from coronavirus. Lord Fox, thank you so much for joining us. Well, my pleasure and hello to everybody who's seeing this, no matter what time and when. We're all learning to live in a slipped times uh, in that uh, we, uh, we broadcast things at one time, but we don't really know when people are seeing them. So good morning, good evening, good night. Thank you. Yes. So uh, I guess first and for foremost, in terms of uh, what, where the role of globalism is heading, what are your thoughts on that? On the one hand, we're seeing more and more countries closing their borders and uh, relying more on the need for self-production, home production. On the other hand, you're seeing, like we are now uh, communicating internationally, you're seeing much more uh, international collaboration. So where are things heading? How's the world going to look post-coronavirus? More globalism or less? Well, first I should say is I don't think anybody knows the answer to any of your questions. So this my, uh, my ideas are as, as, as worthy as anyone else's. And, and I think to some extent the, the answers vary according to how long the epidemic goes on and how much um, economic effect it has uh, as we go forward. Um, because I think there are, two, there are two aspects, and I think you've already alluded to them. There's the economic globalism, and then there's what you could call personal globalism and human globalism. And, and perhaps the two are moving in different directions. Um, I think one of the disappointments has been for people like me who were broadly internationalist in our viewpoint has been how poor the internationalist response has been and, and how narrow na nation states have approached the issue. And, and I do think that as this epidemic continues and as it perhaps emerges into third world nations and countries which need international help, we might see a revival of, 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 of the true internationalist approach to dealing with things because it is in nobody's interest to be sitting in, at home and, and have a hotbed of infection sitting in another country uh, somewhere in the world. So I do hope that there is an internationalist approach. But turning to the broader sense, we've seen with science, for example, the, the, uh, the, the preponderance of people working in, in an open way in science. So working with open data, working in shared research, uh, pooling resources. We see that at a corporate level. So we've seen a British pharmaceutical company uh, announce that it's working with a French one. We've seen uh, US and British and Jap Japanese and, 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 and British companies working together in a, in, a, in, a, in a collective effort to find vaccines and find cures. We've also seen individuals reaching out to people they know and people they get to know across, across the world uh, in terms of science and, 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 and knowledge. And I think that's been uh, perhaps encouraging and the human spirit of, of collaboration has been one of the um, actually, the upsides of what we've seen, we've seen in this country, and I'm sure you've seen it in your communities, communities moving together and working together and, and trying to create support mechanisms for people who, who need help in, in, in a way that we haven't seen for a very long time. We've seen you know, people work within their families, but not work, work within their communities to the level we've seen. And then I think there's, there's an even more sort of social level where people have, have reached out I've got friends all over the world and I've sent small messages to them using the, the best medium to get through to them is, you know, how are you? How's your family? How are things going on? So I think there's been human activity on an international level, probably on a scale we've never seen. There's been scientific activity, which has been encouraging and open and, and desperately seeking the quickest route to get to a vaccine or get to a, 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 an effective cure. But at, at an institutional level and a government to government level, I think internationalism has, has perhaps failed. Uh, you know, you mentioned so beautifully the idea of increased connection between people. And it is amazing to see, uh, you know, obviously we would be remiss if we didn't mention the extraordinary courage of doctors, nurses and frontline workers who are just doing unbelievable work. And we are seeing this incredible 
humanity rising to the occasion. Uh, on the other hand, I wonder, we are seeing now, especially in North America, when talking about getting back to work, we are seeing tensions between young and old, uh, immune, uh, immune people, people versus people who are immunodeficient. And so you are seeing a bit more friction. How do you see tensions like that resolving themselves in terms of when there is a conflict between those who feel like they are uh, immune to this terrible virus versus those who feel like they are more vulnerable? Yeah, well, I mean, I just just pull back from that a bit because because I think I think I think it there's some big questions in there, and and, and I alluded earlier on to to how devastating or otherwise the economic effect of the virus will have, and and you're, first of all, you're right to single out um, medics and and other um, care workers, but also one of the interesting features in this country, in the United Kingdom, has been that some of the lowest paid workers have proved to be some of the most important. So the guys who empty your, your refuse, the guys who are delivering your food, the guys who are, and by guys, I mean men and women, of course, uh, who, are, who are stacking your shelves and making sure that your stores stay open. These people who are some of the least well-paid, many who, who are on short-term contracts, paid by the hour, these are the people who've, who've proved to society how much value they give to society. And I, and I think when we emerge from this, if in our own communities we don't recognize that, and I mean that recognize it economically with individuals, then I think um, we've done something wrong. So I think one of the things that, 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 that to, to some extent has to happen is, is, is a sort of economic re-reckoning in terms of what, what does society value and what does society value most? And, and, and so you and I, uh, have the luxury of sitting behind a computer having these conversations but there's a whole bunch of people um, across your country and mine who don't have the money to to have these connections don't have the connections and are really worried economically about how long this shutdown carries on because even when they're going to work they have a hand-to-mouth existence they can hardly you know they're in debt right. they can hardly service their daily lives mm -hmm. now the government's our respective governments have taken different routes about how we seek to support those people. And in, in, in the US, a check has emerged to, to I think, uh, whether it's arrived yet or is supposedly in the post to people. Um, in the UK, there's various support mechanisms uh, in terms of, uh, of, of people's lives. But it's absolutely clear that, that, that those on the, the margins have suffered the worst from this from this um, um, crisis, this tragedy, really. And, and when we come to unwind all of this, I, I think society does have to recognize that and recognize that some of the social measures that we were happy to leave behind, we have to think about again. And, and that's not, I'm not talking about communism, I'm not talking about socialism, I'm talking about enlightened self-interest, that actually these are the people we need we all need for our daily lives. And it's time actually, actually that some of them were economically recognized or that all of them were recognized for their, for, for their contribution. So that's the first, if you like, tension that, 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 that will need to be resolved. Um, you will mention about young and old or um, those who have immunity or think they have immunity versus those who don't. And, uh, there's, there's a group of people, and I think I'm one of them, who wander around saying, well, I had it mildly, so I think I'm okay. Wow. But you don't know, if you don't really know until there's an antibody test, whether you do have antibodies. You don't know until there's a reliable test, because the tests that the government are rolling out, as I'm sure you know, test whether you've got it at the time. They can't test whether you had it historically. And until we know that fact, we don't really know how many people had it. In the UK, they've been doing some sort of randomized testing using um, it, actually the Atomic Weapons Agency, uh, which has all of the, the weird um, chemical weapons testing technology and all of mm -hmm. that. They've been using special tests to test for antibodies and they've been doing randomized tests. And it only looks like in this country that about 5% of the population have contracted it. Wow. So far fewer than people thought 
um, initially, um, we would get it. Now we don't really know if that's true, but that seems to be the that seems to be the 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 data that the government is currently running off. Mm -hmm. So so if that's the case, then the habits are a very small minority compared to the could have it. And 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 the thing we have to remember is that if you're a young person, the chances of you dying from it are much less than if you're right. an older person. And if you're a woman, actually, the chances of you dying it, dying from it are much less than if you're a man. And interestingly, the statistics in this country show that there's a, a vastly more men have died from this disease than, than women, um, which is um, interesting, especially if you're a man, of course, um, and an older man, as I am. So um, um, the, the thing we have to impress on younger folk is just because you're not going to... Um, perish or the likelihood of you perishing from this is low if you have it the chances of you giving it to someone who could perish yeah. are very high mm -hmm. so maintaining a sense of social responsibility within communities is going to be very important and and mm -hmm. that that message of we're all in it together is, is a really important message and you rightly say that there can be tensions in that message as they stand at the moment in the uk Generally speaking, people get it. Um, now, as the economic tensions become greater, will people be less inclined to get it? I think that's probably true. Um, and, and it's going to be very important from a public information point of view to maintain the notion that just because, um, you know, you, you, um, you may not be vulnerable doesn't mean to say that you won't put other people into danger. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, you're right. There, there is an opportunity for for tension, and and everybody's looking at the you know the end game. How do we come out of this? And and it's interesting, you know, in your country, President Trump has made made an announcement, essentially putting the onus onto governors. So it'll be interesting to see how the governors exercise, I think, rights that they already had in a sense in terms of how they go about unwinding their communities. I I think it's very clear in your country and in ours, that there's a differential exposure going on. So some of the big cities in our country, as in yours, have been the worst hit. And some of the, the areas of deep countryside, which is where I originally come from, I'm a, I'm a farm boy by, by, by breeding, and um, my, my actual hometown is still, is still relatively clear. Um, so I think some of the 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 the, the um, current constraints will perhaps come off in differently in different places. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating! Uh, you know, Thomas Friedman in the New York Times says that uh, historians will be looking at future events in terms of uh, BC and AC before Corona and after Corona. And so I wonder, how is it that you see that the world is going to be different once we've completely overcome this? I know we're still at the, at the midst of it and, and things are really difficult, but God willing, there will come a time and we'll be past this. How do you see the post-coronavirus world being different than the one from before? Well, we have to be um, careful that we do remember. So... So one of the things we should be doing now is, is, is remembering to remember what's different and what we want to be different, because there, there is a danger that, that we rush headlong back into same old, same old. And, and, um, and why is it a danger? Well, because, because in a sense, that same old helped to create where we are now. So, so it isn't clear how much change will happen. And it's not clear how fast that change will happen. Again, I think the longer this goes on, um, the more change will have to happen because quite simply going back to where we, where we were won't be possible. So in this country, for example, already the, the town centres, the high streets, won't be the same again because oh. a lot of companies won't reopen. Wow. Stores that have existed for generations are not going to reopen. They've already filed for bankruptcy. Um, and people's habits about how they shop mm -hmm. and, and how they go about doing things. Some of it will be online and some of it will be using more local shop, local shops. And that, that combination of big shops online and small shops with your local shop 
your local store uh, is already changing. Um, so things like that, commercial activity. Um, everybody's talking about how we're working more from home and talking to people like I'm talking to you. Um, and that might change travel. So it will be interesting to see how the airlines and the holiday industry um, survive. Okay. Um, the, 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 but don't forget, there's an awful lot of people who do their jobs that they can't do from home. They have right. to go back to their workplace. They have to go back to their yeah. factory, their store, their office in order to do their daily jobs. And for right. them, for them, I think the question we have to ask is, well, what will change for those people? And we have to make sure that the people who've, who've made sacrifices get some benefit from this. Mm -hmm. So I think right. societally, we have to look at what, what benefit will mm -hmm. the people who've, who've suffered get from this? Right. I mean, I, I come from New York City and it's a city that I love and uh, it's been hit so hard and uh, partially because of its density. And so I wonder, do you see, and, and I'm thinking, for example, of some of my students, they're sitting in their apartments and they're in lockdown for now over a month. Do you see this generation moving away from urban life to the more uh, countryside or suburban life? because of this? Do you see a generation that's not going to recover from this trauma and, and move towards a more open space life? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm several generations adrift from that. Um, my daughter, who is 35, she, she, she's in that situation. She's in, in the truly urban. She, she, was, she lives in the middle of what was the first big hotspot in London. And, and thankfully, so far, She's keeping safe and being sensible. But um, it's interesting because I think at the moment, if you ask people that question, they'll probably say, yes, I'm thinking about it. Yes, I'm thinking about a more suburban life. Yes, I'm thinking about a more um, rural life. But the question, that, that when it means something, is when the coffee shop reopens, when, when the bar reopens, when they get back together again in those social groups that meet physically as well as meet virtually, will, will, how, how, how vivid will the memory be of the fact that their park is closed because there's too many people and they can't go for a walk in the park, which is what's happening in London. Um, the park next to my daughter has been closed because there's quite literally too many people and they cannot practice social isolation in it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's um, so so I don't I, I mean I think you have to ask them that generation but if you ask them now you might get a different answer uh, question to after that first mm -hmm. coffee shop coffee mm -hmm. got it okay and then uh, finally an important question is in terms of religion I know that uh, many members in the uh, Jewish community in, in Great Britain have been affected greatly by this do you see a uh, room for greater collaboration and coexistence as a result of this between different religious groups? Do you see a vision of a more shared humanity and need to step up for each other's needs uh, going forward? Well, I'd like to. I mean, I'd like to think that, that, that um, and, and, and I think I can give an example in, in, in Windsor, my hometown here, mm -hmm. where the churches are collaborating to work with the homeless people. Wow. So all of, all of the Windsor churches are working together in one project that's actually located in the Catholic church because they've got the best facility to do it from. Mm -hmm. And we donate to that, to that facility. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think, I think at a community level, mm -hmm. it's probably happening. I hope it's happening. I hope it's happening in New York. I don't think we can afford to run six parallel homeless projects right yeah one good one one good uh -huh. one is what is what is what people need um again the question is how long will the memory be because as as, as you intimated with you know the the the, the, the potential onset of, of social tension mm -hmm. religious tension of course is, 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 is there as an undercurrent in, 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 in many countries and many societies. At the moment, 
life is too hard to be having those arguments. Well, let's, yeah. let's remind ourselves when we get to the other side. All right. Well, that was very inspiring and very insightful. And I can't thank you enough for your uh, wisdom and insight. And most importantly at this time is, uh, like you're saying, stay safe, care for others, uh, look out for others. And uh, I really can't thank you enough and very much look forward to speaking at better times. Let's, and let's hope they're soon. And my best wishes to everybody. And as you say, stay safe and also stay kind. I think people have been kinder. Let's keep it yeah. that way, okay? Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.